Uh, in verse 3, Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer. Then when he gets down to verse 9, he says it again. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge. I'm reading from the New American Standard. And all discernment, so that you may prove the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, that would be the rapture, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the fruit of righteousness, how it comes to us through Christ and how it brings glory and praise to God. That will be our subject matter. It will take us the two services, uh, probably, uh, to complete it. Um, so let's have a word of prayer. And then we're going to get into our morning study and explain to you what does righteousness mean and what does the fruit of righteousness mean? I mean, it, it kind of makes sense. What is the, what is the product of righteousness? What does righteousness produce? What is the fruit of righteousness. Now, here is the tree of righteousness. What kind of righteous fruit does it produce? So we'll we'll look at that and we'll study that because Paul has has brought that to our attention. Uh, you don't have righteousness apart from Christ, but if you do, you ought to be seeing the fruit of it in the Christian life. And Paul is praying that they would do that. Paul is praying that they would do it. So let's have a word of prayer uh, for ourselves about this regard. As a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, church age, at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit is there to teach you and recall the Word of God, John 14, 26. He can't do that in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, or vert sins. These must be confessed in silence and privacy to remove you from the flesh of carnality and into the spirit. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. So I give you a moment to do that so that you can get something beneficial out of this. This could be a real life-changing experience for you today to understand the fruit of righteousness. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us. Pray that, again, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls that we might exercise it in our life, not only to ourselves but to others who need to know. So I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister through this hour into the Word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at the top of your paper uh, where it says the fruit of righteousness. I gave you the Greek word, dikaiosune. See dikaiosune? Here's what I want you to pay attention to. See the Suffix S-U-N-E, the it's on the end of the word. See that on the, that's a suffix. You can have a prefix on the front of the word, or you can have a suffix on the end of the word, and it adds dynamics to the word in the Greek language. That's a Greek word. Circle the S-U-N-E, and I'm going to tell you what that means. Why that's important. In the Greek language, that suffix, when S-U-N-E is added to a word, which is the word righteous, he wants you to focus on the quality or character or essence of the word. Do you understand that? He's either going to emphasize as a quality, a characteristic, or an essence. Now, let me tell you why this is important. That, why that S-U-N-E-I is important at the end of it. Because righteousness that Paul is going to talk about is the righteousness of God. When you study the characteristics of God, you will discover that God is sovereign, 
that God is absolute righteousness, that his eternal life and his love and his omnipresent, omnipotent, you know this characteristics of God, right? Well, maybe. Because what he just did when he put S-U-N-E on the end of that word as a suffix in the Greek language, he says, this righteousness I'm talking about is the righteousness of God that is given to you in Jesus Christ that can produce the fruit of righteousness in your life. You understand that? I, we just read that. See, the emphasis on this righteousness that he's using, the kaiosune, is the emphasis on the essence of God. When, when Paul is talking about the righteousness, he's not talking about your good behavior. He's talking about a characteristics of the life of God called absolute righteousness that you have possession of when you believe the Lord Jesus Christ. When you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, you now possess the righteousness of God. And he wants you to understand that that righteousness of God, you got at salvation, which we'll learn this today, has fruits. It's going to bear, bear divine production of the righteousness of God in your life. Now you say, Ron, I've never heard that before. I know. <laughs> you did today. I just read it to you. I didn't make it. I didn't make this up. Now, the other thing that I want you to understand is that I introduced at the very top of your paper, remember that verses 9 through 11 is one Greek sentence. 9 through 11 is one Greek sentence. We've been talking about this. We've been in this passage a couple weeks. That's one Greek sentence, which means that's one completed thought. In other words, verse 9, 10, and 11 go together before you draw any conclusions. You have to read 9, 10, and 11. You say, well, my Bible don't show that. Well, I, I don't know what your Bible shows. It should show, though, in the Greek manuscript, it shows 9, 10, and 11 as a Greek sentence. All right? And that's what's important for us. The Greek sentence also that you need to know is offered as a prayer. Everything that he is saying to the church, he's offering as a prayer to God for the, on behalf of the church, right? Well, look, in verse 9, and this I pray, and then he goes to specifics, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and, and discernment, so that, the divine purpose, so that you may approve the things which are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. All of that is contained in one completed thought that Paul has, that's the, which is the content of his prayer. Do you understand that? He started his prayer in verse 3. Now he shifted the content that was carried in 3 through 8. He has now carried it into a different look. Another con content of his prayer is expressed. Have you not been praying for something that all of a sudden the, the Spirit of God touches you and you go off another direction and then come back? My, 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 my. We've all had that experience, I hope, in our prayer life. So I carried all that in my introduction uh, start for you. And what I did for you is I took this prayer. I took this prayer now. I took this prayer and I broke it into three parts. I broke that prayer into three parts. Three parts that, in other words, the content of Paul's prayer. He started a prayer and then he shifted in that prayer. During that prayer, he shifted the content. To, he moved it a different direction or he moved it off, off, off to another way. What? Are you supposed to read the book of Philippians every week? Yes, it's only four chapters. You can do that just by going to the bathroom every day. Read, the, read a chapter or something. 
this is not a this is not a high demand on you, but you should read this little book. It's a powerful book. This little book of Philippians is just a powerful book. That's the reason I chose to teach it. It's a powerful book. And so the Greek sentence, it, that's not. So remember, he starts off and he says, and this I pray for you. And then he goes, three, there's three parts to it. And I, I put it one part, second part, third part on your paper to show you the content, to show you the content of his prayer. Here's the first thing. And listen, are they all connected? And, and they trying to get you into one. He's trying to get you into one completed idea. I want you to see one big picture is what he's saying. I want you to he put it in one sentence because I want you to see this big picture. All right. Watch what he does now. Watch what part one, part two and part three of this. And they're interconnected. Watch this now. He says God's love may abound, he's talking about the Christian life, G that God's love may abound, and he's talking about, ab ab by the word abound, it it's going to become more obviously uh, obvious to you. See, listen, all of the production in the life of a Christian, every bit of it flows from the love of God. Every bit of it. And you need to be consciously aware of it. Paul is aware of how important God's love is, and it should be abounding. It, it should be moving across your, your Christian life. When, when you go to the bank, love's abounding. When you go to the post office, love, I don't know where you go. My point is... God's love needs to be abounding... How much? How much? Well, what's the Bible say? I don't want your opinion. What's the Bible say? More and more. You know, he, he, he said the word still. In other words, God's love is working in you, Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God has been shed abroad into your heart. Romans, if you don't know that, you should write it down, shouldn't you? Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God has been poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit. You have the love of God, and the love of God should be abounding in our life. It should be moving and active in the Christian life a little bit. More and more. You know what that's a sign of? Listen to me. That's a sign of you being spiritual, and it's a sign of your spiritual growth. When it's, when it's only going a little by little, your spiritual growth, growth is not moving fast enough. You're not, take, you're not cycling the Word of God daily in your life. You're not studying it. You're not applying it. Write this down. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scripture is profitable under these conditions, and he lists them. You should know that, people. You write it down because you're supposed to what? Study it. I can only teach it, people. I can't. Now, watch this now. Watch this now. That God's love may abound. Get actively and involved in your life, may abound. Still more and more. Watch this now. He tells you in two things. In real knowledge, in real knowledge, I don't know how other translations did it, but that's one Greek word. That's not two. That's epinosis. I wrote it on your paper. Gnosis means to get knowledge. And knowledge of the word of God, because context is what's important here. Real knowledge of the word of God. Love is abounding and it's expanding in your life and in the affairs of your life to other people. And it's doing more and more and more and more because you're growing, 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 growing. You're growing 
And, and love is moving and love is abounding more and more because you are spiritually growing. Epinosis is knowledge. See, see the, look, at, look at the word on your paper. See that it has a prefix. See EPI? That's a preposition on the front of gnosis. Gnosis is the word knowledge. Epi on the front of it means knowledge that has become fully understood. Fully. Full of knowledge. You see, when you get knowledge from the Word of God, He's telling you what He's, he's expecting of you. When you get into full knowledge, now you are actively engaged in the will of God. You're actively engaged in the Word of God. And you are coming to fully realize the dynamics and the importance of that. We call that the, we call that the faith cycle. Faith comes by hearing, then you've got to believe it, you've got to apply it, and then God completes it. Listen to me, listen to me. Yeah, you're a visitor, and I understand this. Look, just be patient with me. It will take you a year to get your spiritual feet under you. You spend one year with me, your life will never be the same. Spiritually speaking. Because you've got to study the word of God. Listen, Romans 10, 17, faith, faith. We're told to walk by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You've got to hear it, believe it. You've got to cycle it. And when you do, mighty and powerful things will begin to happen in your life. Because you'll see the dynamics of God working in your personal life. Your answers will be prayer. Uh, God will solve issues in your life. He will give you, when you walk in the Spirit, He will give, in, in all circumstances, he will, give you, he will give you the love of God. He will give you the peace of God. He will give you the joy of God. He will give patience of God, yada, yada, yada. Galatians 5, 22, 23. But look, look, you've got to hear this stuff more than once. You don't get it in one hearing. You get it after a second hearing, a third hearing, because doctrine builds on doctrine. Nobody, no teacher trying to teach you the English alphabet actually asks you the first day to write a thesis. You haven't even learned the alphabet. You have to learn the alphabet to put words together, and you have to learn words to put sentences together. Now you can write a little bit. See what I mean? And so it is with the Word of God. You've got to, you've got to, well, I just encourage you. So love abounds still more and more in real knowledge, in full knowledge because of the prefix, full knowledge of the directive will of God that comes from the Word of God, all Scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. You wrote on your paper, all Scripture is inspired of God. And it, and it has an active participation in your life. If you read it, it'll tell you one, two, three, four, and five. You ought to write it down. You ought to read it. You ought to take it serious. Okay? And discernment. Discernment is the application of it and standing back and seeing what God does. Discernment. You know what discernment is? It's, it's seeing something. Uh, I don't see it. I don't say, oh, I get it. That's called discernment. You need to see God be active in your life where you can step back and see God do something because you believe he, he said he would do it and he did it. And then you step back and you go like, whoa. <laughs> whoa. That's discernment. And you go like, I'm going back to eat that place. That's good food. I'm going back to get some more of that stuff. Yes. And so, in, in the second thing Paul is saying here, so that, which is a divine purpose, he's established a divine purpose in this sentence, so that you may approve. That's dokimazo in the Greek language. There are two Greek words for testing. Let me show you how they might work. The, the first word that's used in the Greek language to test it, it's not this word, but it means like 
to go say you you're in pre-law you graduate from Alabama I know I know I thought I would wake somebody up you graduate you still have to go to law school right you go to law school they give you a second degree they've tested you twice and guess what you still can't practice law you have to be approved you have to stay take a state exam to get approval you didn't get it when you graduated with the first degree you didn't get it from the, whether you were in Alabama or Auburn with a second degree you got to have approval that's our word docu, dokimazo and I have a good word dokimazo dokimazo that's our word and that's why they translated dokimazo instead of instead of instead of saying testing they said approval because it's testing for approval you got a little knowledge did you get when you got went through the first four years do you have any knowledge of law no. that's why you had to go to law school they just suckered you in for four years in the old day of education you just went to law school you just went to dental school you just went to veterinarian school and then you went to work but you can't make that much money doing all that so now we go through yeah yeah yeah, yeah to get where we want to be all right which in the long run may not be a bad thing because a lot of people get over there and didn't like what they got and so they can go back to their first four year degree and push off into something else like I did but anyhow as a whole lot of talk for just the word approval wasn't it you, that you may approve that's testing for approval that's major testing for approval watch this now so that you may approve the things that have been talked about in the first section of his prayer full knowledge and discernment that are excellent Let me tell you what he's talking about because he used the word epinosis so let's just take that idea a moment about epinosis which is full knowledge it's the word of God that's actively engaged in your life and you have discernment about it you understand that well you should so here he wants you to see that when that happens that's excellence but you know what's excellence about it is how you got it you know how you got it listen to me because excellence is as good as you can get there's nothing above excellence that's the gold medal that's not bronze and silver that's gold excellence this is it now listen to me here's what he's talking because of epinosis and discernment he's talking about watch me now he's talking about reaching and maintaining spiritual maturity that life of the Word of God working in your life either inhale or exhale that's what the first that's what second Timothy 3 16 17 said all scripture is inspired or God breathed the word inspired means God breathed that's inhale exhale right yes. well hold your breath for a day <laughs> <laughs> and you'll discover God breathe it breathing is inhale exhale so you take the Word of God in and you apply it in and out in and out in and out is the breathing all scripture has been designed by God to take it in and put it out to cycle it into your soul and then to help other people do the same thing and it tells you what it, uh, what will happen he lists the things that will happen when you do that within your your soul structure of 2 Timothy 3 16 17 
So he has said, so that you may approve the things that are excellent. That's epinosis taking into full maturity. When you, when you go to college, you go through 100 category, you go through 100 called 100 category, then they move you to 200 class, right? A class that's identified as 200 in something, the same course, the same subject matter. You're at 100, that's introduction. Then they move, move you up to 200, which is a, now we're getting involved in a little bit of what we introduced you to. Then you get into 300 level. Now you're getting in, they either hook you into going more into that degree or that, or not. A lot of kids, when they get to a 300 level, they go like, I think I want to do that professionally. And they'll, they'll, they'll go like, look at, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be something. I, I like this. And then they move you to a four and a 500 category. Now you're into master's and, and, and doctorate level. The same is true with the word of God. You start out as a baby believer. You have elementary ideas about the word of God. They're elementary. It's reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's elementary. And then he moves you on. And as you grow from a baby believer to a, 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 an immature believer to a mature believer to the excellence, which we call super grace believer, who, who has reached that excellence and holds it by cycling the word of God in and out every day of your life. It, it, it's not something that's hard to do. It's just something I look forward to doing every day. There's the difference. I hope, I hope my prayer is for you, as Paul's prayer was for them, that you fall in love with the word of God and learn to cycle it daily in your life and grow into a mature person in Jesus Christ. Let me show you that mature person. Write this down. Write this down. Or, or somewhere by your second Timothy, uh, Philippians 4. In Philippians 4, looking at verses 13 through 15, Paul picks this idea up again. Most everybody knows 4.13. They don't understand it in context sometimes, but a lot of people mem memorize 413. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? That's one of those great, great verses that people get. And that's a wonderful, and it's wonderful, and it will hold your stuff together. Until, as you advance in your, in your spiritual growth. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, <laughs> see, we miss that. We get we memorize that and then miss the second verse. Nevertheless, well, that's a powerful idea that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's a pretty powerful idea. Nevertheless, <laughs> did you get that? Nevertheless, Paul writes, you have done well to share with me in my afflictions. They have, that little church supported his missionary activities. I mean, they shared their, they, they shared their beans with him. They cut back on their food supply to send him money for his food. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my afflictions. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. What's my point? Here's Paul's point. You can do all things through Christ, and you should, and you should be experiencing them. See, 14 and 15 is about the experience of that.
Yeah, giving and receiving. He said, you know what? Your giving and receiving has come off a wonderful biblical principle that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And because of that, it strength, your faith strengthens me on the mission field. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Listen, missionaries know that. Missionaries know that. You know what missionaries ask for? A good missionary never asks for money. You know what a good missionary asks for? Prayer. Prayer. Because if the people will pray, they will give because they're engaged and they're involved and they know what's going on. And they know his struggles out there and they want to make it as they want the gospel preached under all conditions. Even when he went to prison, they supported him into prison because the gospel was still being preached even in prison. And people were being saved. Well, here's the third part of his prayer. Now, remember, this is a prayer. I just broke the prayer down into three parts because it's a powerful little prayer. Listen to the third thing that he had to say. Listen to the, listen to the third thing. Oh, this holding tell excellency, the second part where it says excellent, Look at the word. How, how long is he to hold that? How long is he to hold his spiritual maturity, the cycling daily of the word of God in his life, in and out, in and out, in and out, growing, growing, and going? That's excellency. That's reaching spiritual maturity and maintaining. Until when? He tells you until when? Until the day of Christ. You know what that is? That's a rapture. The day of Christ. Till the day of Christ. I'm to do that as a Christian until the day Christ returns. For me, that's a rapture. Well, anyhow, that's... You know what that says? Here's a guy that's growing, that's looking out, not paying attention to where, he, where he's come from, not paying attention to where he is. He's paying attention to where he's going. It said until. Until the day... He's moved way past his past life. He's gone. The past life was gone. The present life is just active. I'm looking here, out front. You're looking out front. Are you a rear view mirror person? Or are you, are you, you know? Well, here's the third part of his prayer. This is powerful because it comes to my subject, believe it or not. Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which is, we call it the absolute righteousness. We call it plus R, just so you don't have to write it down. That means, plus R always means absolute righteousness, which is the character of God in you. Absolute righteousness, which comes is not in the Greek text, so I put a line through it. It should read, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, here's what's interesting. See that word filled? It's the word pleuroo in the Greek language. Pleuro is a very interesting word because it means to fill up a deficiency. If you do, and, and you know, you pay, for, you pay me to study all the time, and I do. So I research words like this to the nth degree. There was a guy called Fallo who brought this word really out into great understanding. Where he saw this word and it became acceptable from that period all the way till today to fill up a deficiency. It is a scholarly definition. Believe me when I tell you, it's a scholarly definition of Flero. I've studied it all myself. Having been filled, now watch. I wrote it down. 
That's a perfect passive participle, nominative plural masculine in the Greek language. It's on your paper. I wrote it down, the perfect tense, the passive voice, and the participle. I'm going to tell you what that all means in the Greek language. It, it means similar to this in the English, but people forget English. So I, I remind you what it means in the Greek. The perfect tense in the Greek language is an interesting concept of perfect tense because English means, you, you, you can have been filled as in English, right? Having been filled? It was written in English, right? And you know it's a pastime, but here's what the Greeks knew about it. That something was completed in the past, perfect tense, with the results that it remains completed in the future. That's a pretty powerful idea. Keep it all working. Yeah, it's going to be filled. Having been filled at the point of salvation, you were filled with righteousness. And as you have advanced in the Christian life, that righteousness has taken on fruit bearing. You have been filled. The righteousness of God, listen to me. The righteousness of God fills up a deficiency in an unbeliever's life. You know why? Uh, in a moment, I'll get to it. It's point one. Wow, this is all introduction. Do you understand the perfect tense? I mean, do, do you, I wrote it on your paper, so now you know it. The passive voice means that the subject receives it, is not, doesn't participate in it. He doesn't participate in it, he receives it. That's the passive voice. The subject receives the fruit of the, of the impute, when the righteousness is imputed, the righteousness of God has the characteristics of producing a fruit. You understand that? It's a fruit tree of righteousness, right? It's a fruit tree. So in the passive voice, this is a great, listen, this is great. Righteousness comes to the, the unbeliever as a gift, right? The righteousness of God comes through Jesus Christ to the unbeliever and fills up a deficiency. He does not have righteousness. He could never have righteousness. He's declared by the word of an unbeliever is declared by the word of God as unrighteous. I'll show it to you in a minute. I'm just telling you how it's laid out in the Greek text. I'm telling you how it's laid out. All right? Now, the participle, the participle, I'm sorry? If it's passed to us, we receive it. Yes. It's given to us and we receive it. Uh, you, you're... You know, it's not, you may not even be mindful of it. When you receive it, you get it because it comes with, it's one of the 50 things you get at salvation. You can never lose in time and eternity. Pick up one of those little pamphlets. I guess we got them back there. Uh, 50 things. You get this as part of the grace package. Okay, it's, it's called imputed. Okay, the participle though, remember this is a part of it, it's PTC, that's participle abbreviation. The participle re rep uh, presents the doctrinal principle, a doctrinal principle. When you see a participle, it's working off a main verb and it's established in a principle. A doctrinal principle. You always look for that. It's always connected to a main verb and it's always pushing the idea. Now, I've been pushing the idea through this whole prayer. It's Paul's prayer. And the point, now we're to a doctrinal point of it. Being filled with the fruit of righteousness. Well, that's just how it, that's how it works out. Uh, let me deal with point one, then we'll take a little break and come back and I'll finish this, the second service, the second hour. There's a deficiency in every unbeliever. If you've never believed that Jesus, if, listen, I don't, I'm not talking about, have you ever heard? I'm talking about have you ever believed? Here's the deal. 
Jesus, God sent his son to die on a cross for our sins. That's a damning sin. That's not personal sin. That's a damning sin. Romans 5, 12 through 21. Wherefore is by one man, Adam, sin entered the world and death by sin. And so the sin death spread to all mankind. Romans 5, 12 through 21. As a result of Adam's sin, and you're born in it, you are classified unrighteous. It's one of the 13 judicial charges against every human born in Adam. We're born in the human race. We're born in Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, write this down. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In Adam, all die spiritually. In Christ, all are spiritually made alive. One of the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin is unrighteousness. You are, all human beings are born because of Adam, our first ancestral father, were born because of Adam's sin into spiritual death, and we are born unrighteous. Now, Paul is going to pick this subject up for us in Romans. He's going to pick it up in Romans, the third chapter. In the third chapter, I pull down verse 10. I'm going to read verses 10 through 12, and I want you to pay attention to something. Look. For me, as, as your pastor or your teacher, or however you, you want to, or a guy that you just come and listen to once in a while, listen. Stop just reading the Bible and start studying it. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. The difference between reading and studying. Right? If you're going to grow in the Lord, you've got, you got to start learning to study the Bible and not just read it. Watch this now. I'm in, I'm in Romans, the third chapter. And I'm going to read from verses 10 through 12. Tell me how many times he's going to say none or not even one. Are you with me? I, and don't give it verbally to me, but I want you to count them to see we come up with the same number. I'm amazed we can read the same passages and never get the same numbers. So watch this. What are we looking for? None or not even one. All right? So this comes out of Psalms 14, if you have a study Bible. It is written, Psalms 14, this is a quote from John, uh, uh, Psalms. There is none righteous. How many? There, how many? Is, how many? None. No, I mean, how many? There, there are none what? There are none righteous. Uh, that, that's one none. <laughs> okay. There is none righteous, not even one. So now we have two. There is none, number three, who understand. There is none, four, who seek for God and have turned aside together. They have become useless there is none who does good. There is not even one. Does that, does that idea dominate that passage? See, you should know that. You should know that. When you study it, you go like, whoa, that's a lot. Because you're always looking for markers. What's he talking about? What's he? Listen, a good teacher always is always repeating things he wants you to learn. Agreed? How, how many righteous unbelievers are there? None. None. Oh, wait a minute, Ron. Wait a minute. How about the guy who was moral? <laughs> Is he unrighteous? Yes. How about the guy who's um, 
Who's religious? Right? You've got to be born again. How do you get out of Adam and into Christ? <laughs> Wharton's telling you, we may get that. These may be gate questions. <laughs> yeah. The moment you believe the gospel of Christ. Now, you got to listen to me. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. you got to listen to me. You got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, Adam's sin. I'm not asking you to identify all of yours. They don't matter. Christ died for all sin. That's Adam's sin. 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. You're never charged with personal sin until you become a believer. You are unrighteous. And the only way that can be removed from your life is you've got to believe that Jesus came. He died on that cross to remove Adamic sin from your life. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day to give you a new lease on life that will take you all the way to heaven. And that's the absolute truth. And don't you believe a lie because it'll damn your soul. You need to believe that. The moment you believe the gospel of Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, the moment you believe that, your unrighteousness is, is removed and the righteousness of God is imputed to you by the grace of God. It is given to you, your name, to your life, by the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. You will never be unrighteous again. That is removed from your life by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is gone. And in its place is the essence of the very character of God, absolute righteousness. It is a gift. You didn't earn it to get it, and you can't lose it. It is a gift of your salvation. What a wonderful concept that is. I gave you, a, and listen, you know what the Bible calls that experience? Listen to what he calls it. He calls it adoption. You know why? And I wrote this on your paper. Hebrews 12, 8, 9 says, we're illegitimate children's. Children's. Even that sounded weird. To me, we're illegitimate children. In, in, the King James called us bastards. In uh, Hebrews 12, 8, 9, Paul turns around and says, yes, because we're adopted. We're adopted in Galatians 4, 4 through 7, and in Romans 8, 15 through 17. I put it on your paper. If I put it on your paper, what should you do this week? Read it. Put it down there for no reason. I don't get credit for how many times I make reference to something. Maybe, maybe I don't, but maybe if you read it, I do. I don't know. All right. So I put that there are none righteous, not even one. I put it down there. How many times he repeated that? Was that important? Oh boy. Howdy doody. Yeah, nobody knows about howdy doody but me. Listen to Romans, the third chapter, and we're going to take a break. Uh, please come back, because I, I, haven't, I haven't got to my subject really good yet. All right? But I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you some caffeine and sugar. We're going, to, we're going to freeload. We're going to do that freely for you. Go downstairs in a little bit through either door. Let me finish this up. Watch this. Listen to what he says. Apart from the law, that's the Mosaic law. You know what the Mosaic law is? It's a system of failure. The Mosaic law was designed to show you that you couldn't keep it. It, it, it was a whole system of failure. It was designed to do that, to show you you're in need of a Savior. 
Well, you should read Romans, the third chapter. It would help you with that. Apart from the law of righteousness of God, apart from the law of the righteousness of God, has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. See, I just explained that. For there is no distinction in those who believe. Well, the Jew thought he had an edge. Nope. The Gentiles thought they might have an edge. Nope. No distinction. Well, the male, nope. Write this down, Galatians 3.28. No distinction is described by Paul. What he means by no distinction is described in Galatians 3.28. I put it on your paper. I spoil you people so bad. God, listen to me, and I'm going to close. God is absolute righteous. He's plus R. He's absolute plus R. He's absolute righteousness. And he sets the norm and standard for all righteous relationships. He sets the standard. When he talks about a fruit of righteousness, he sets the standard for it. It's part of his characteristics. Absolute righteousness is part of the essence of God. Psalms 11, 7, 56, 50 verse 6, 147 to 17, 1 Corinthians 1, 30, which is a good read for you. right so let's take a break uh, we're going to have a word of prayer the men are going to take the offering that's the way we do business around here for our people if you're a visitor just sit tight that's okay uh, this meal has been paid for so and then we're going to take a 15 minute break we got coffee and, and goodies downstairs do a little fellowship with our people and then come on back for we'll complete this study okay Well, point number two on this thing of the fruit of, do, do, of, uh, of righteousness, kakaiosune, all unbelievers, we call them a minus R because they're all unrighteous. We learned that, right? There are none. There are no unbelievers righteous. They're all unrighteous. Uh, an unbeliever can be legally right and he can be morally right. But that don't mean he's saved. He can be legally right, like the Jews, the Pharisees. They thought they were legally right, but they rejected the Messiah. You can't be legally right. So Paul does something really interesting. When Paul talks about that, he, he talks about the law and the prophets. Because if the Jews of the first century had paid attention to the prophets, they had never crucified Christ. They paid only attention to the law. And they saw him, by law, they saw him worthy to be crucified. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, an unbeliever, he can be legally right on issues. He can be morally right, and he can be a religious person, but he's still under Adamic sin. And the only way Adam's sin can be removed is by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It cannot be moved, removed any other way. And here's the proof. Write this down. Colossians 1.13. That's one among many. The whole New Testament is written as evidence that the gospel is how you get into the kingdom. <clears throat> but people think if they keep the law, the Mosaic law, they'll be okay. But Romans, the third chapter says you can't keep it. It was designed not to be able to be kept so that it would prove you a sinner in need of salvation. The law is designed to condemn man. It condemns all the unrighteous because they can't keep it. You got to keep the whole law. 
If you fail in one aspect of it, you fail in all of it. And nobody could do it except Christ. The only person that ever could do that was Christ. We don't have to do it because it was fulfilled in Christ. The whole Mosaic law was fulfilled in Christ. Yeah, that's that Matthew 5th chapter. He came to fulfill the law. Well, the unrighteous can be legally right, can be morally right, can be religious. That doesn't make them spiritual. The only thing that can make you spiritual is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. He was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. 1 through 4 would give you. Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Not works, believes. For by grace are you saved through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Huh? Not of works, least a man should boast. It's a gift. It's a gift. And you know, uh, I used to have a pastor, Marvin Fail, when I was in the military out uh, Fort Bragg. It said, and it's a gift that keeps on giving. It's a gift. And every time he did it, he would always say, and let me tell you something, it's a gift that keeps on giving. Is, it still giving, is he still giving you marvelous things in your life? Because it should be still giving. And that was always his point. Listen to what Jesus taught the Jews about this legal right. Listen to what he told the Jews attending one of his Bible studies about the law and Phariseeism. The Pharisees. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 20, he addressed his disciples and those attending. He said, I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a pretty powerful idea, wasn't it? Boy, there's a way to get rid of half your audience. <laughs> I must have, that's how I must have got rid of half mine. <clears throat> See, for the Jew, the re what he's really saying to the Jew that were in attendance, if you keep the law and reject Christ as your Savior, you're a cooked goose. You keep the law and reject Christ, you're in deep trouble. You're in deep trouble. I say to you, unless your righteousness, notice that word, unless your righteousness, you see, they were trying to keep the law and they couldn't keep it. So you know what the Jews did? Look, what? This is what, this is what religion does too. When the Bible, when what the Bible says become too, too rigid for you and you're trying to keep the law, in other words, you go like, I, here, 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 here is rigid for the, the law of guy. You mean you get by saved, saved by grace and do anything you want to do? You people that believe in grace, you believe that you, you're saved by grace, then you live any way you want to live. None of us believe that. I don't believe that. You're going to be disciplined by the Lord. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. I don't believe that. I don't teach that. I teach grace, though, because grace is a gift. And it has nothing to do with works. So, but the Jews, they, they wanted to keep the law, and they couldn't. They couldn't, you know, because it, the law was designed to condemn, right? Not to, the law was never designed to justify. It was designed to condemn. So you know what they did? Watch this. They wrote a handbook of interpreting the law so they could get away with it. So they came up with all these rules and regulations. Well, but if you do this and you do that, and you do this and you do that. And listen, religion still does it. Well, you can do, you can do penance for this and penance for that. Pen it, pen it, pen it, pen it. Just goofy. Can't do that. So, they came up with this little 
they called it the tradition of the elders. They came up with a little denominational workbook to tell you what you should believe and how you should believe it to get around believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. They worked up what is called in the scriptures the tradition of the elders just to give their people a way to be saved apart from Jesus Christ. Crazy stuff. And we have, we, we've not much improved on it. Now, here's what I've done on your paper. I've given you four examples for home study. These are wonderful examples, too. I gave you four different examples of why moral or legal or religious reasons will not save you. And I gave you some interesting stories, and you should study them, of people who got caught up in it. For example, Pot Potiphar's wife in Matthew 27, 19. Now, you should read the whole passage with that. But Potiphar's wife was really interesting. She went to Potiphar as he was about to make a decision on whether to put Christ to death or not. She had a sleepless night, she said, and had been and had a dream that he should be careful how he administered justice against the righteous man on trial. Some think that she probably was a believer that said that. Others think she made a moral, because moral was a very high deal, that she made a moral decision about it. That this, was a, this is a good man who has done nothing worthy of the crime he's charged with. She, she could be saying, Pilate, you know that he is not guilty of any crime by either our law or their law. This is a good man. He has committed no crime that he's, he has committed no crime that he's being charged with. My point is, she used the word righteous, and this is a good idea for study, and it's a good way, it's a good Bible study. I gave you four Bible studies out of this one thing, and here's Potiphar's wife. Another one that I thought was of interest, I just put things I thought was of interest, was the Sandarian guard, the lead dog, mil military dog, on the crucifixion detail. The crucifixion detail. He was in charge of the crucifixion detail. He was the key guy. And when, when, he, when Christ was on the cross ready to die, he goes like, whoa, this is all wrong. You should read that. You should read the guard's comment, the, the chief guard's con comments uh, uh, that he made in regard to that. And listen, listen to me now, because you don't get this in the English. The English translated how he viewed the man, listen to me, as innocent, which is an okay translation, but that's down the pike. That's the word righteous. We have two people connected with the crucifixion of Christ that declared the man on the cross to be righteous. One was Potiphar's wife, and one was the head, the head knocker at the crucifixion detail, military detail. Because that word innocent is how they're viewing their declaration that that man was righteous, meaning legally there was no cause for his death. Legally, they trumped up charges and murdered him. Are you with me? Remember, I wrote the word for righteous on the paper for you. That's a transliteration. The word innocent in the English is transliteration um, of that. Then uh, I gave you a third one. And I'm telling you, these, are, these would be great Bible studies for you. 
is the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler in Matthew 19, 20, uh, 16 through 26, is a good read. It is a good read for you. You always pay attention to rhetorical questions. When you read the story of the rich young ruler, you pay attention to four questions. Four questions. And you know, you know what Jesus told the guy? Go sell. Do I? Go sell. Go sell all your possessions. For what reason? Do you remember, Gary? Give to the poor. Well, he told him to give to the poor, and he would get what? And yeah, and what would he get for that? Jesus told him what he would get for it. Anybody? He would get treasures in heaven. And he didn't buy into that idea, like a lot of you. You don't realize that the things, the treasures that you lay up in heaven is so much, is going to be so. Listen, you know this for sure that life here is temporal. Would you agree with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know the forever. Yeah. Okay. All right. But you're going to live forever there, right? You're going to live forever in heaven. Yeah. You know how long forever is? Long <laughs> <laughs> it's just long. I don't even know you can put time in it. Lay up, for you, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, right? It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be concerned about the treasures on earth, right? But you should be more concerned about the treasures in heaven. Lay up for you. He told that young man, because a young man asked him, what must I do? He asked, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Right? And so they engage in question and requesting. We call it questioning and counter questioning. You always pay attention to that, especially with Jesus. He was a master at it. And he finally got down to it and he went, Well, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, since you're in to do, sell everything you got and you'll lay up treasures in heaven. And he went, what? It took me 40 years to get that little bit. What? Yeah, what would happen to me? I don't know. You'll die and go to heaven and have treasures. Do you buy into that idea? Yeah, it's not likely. You should, though, shouldn't you? Well, when you get to doubt it, go back and Study your buddy. Study your buddy, the rich young ruler. And then Peter to Cornelius, I think, is a wonderful story about righteousness. See, all these are about righteousness. These are all, these are wonderful Bible studies. Uh, You should teach these. These are wonderful Bible studies. Of course, you know, Peter, he's in that legalistic system, and now God wants to save everybody. The same way. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We Jews ought to have a special pass than the Gentiles. We, we, we need a, like a, a special pass. Nah. nah. Well, we, may, we men have a special pass. Nah. Well, we free people have a special pass. Nah. You know, that's in Galatians 3.28. Did you know that's in Galatians 3.20? Because people were thinking this way. And, and Paul goes like, nah. Nah. Nope. We're all one in Christ. We're all one in Christ. And we should be so thankful for that. Well, you ought to read that, my opinion. I gave you four great Bible studies, either for your personal life or for somebody else. I recommend you read it for yourself and then teach it to somebody else once you understand it. Four great studies, in my opinion. My, did you, you've got Galatians 3.28. Make sure you know that. Now, let me, cl- let me close. 
<laughs> with another hour. No, I'm going to. I looked down at my paper and I went, hey, macro. I called Al during the week and I said, Al, I'm looking at my study. I'm going to have to have the whole time. Every person who believes that Jesus died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, we call it the gospel, receives imputed righteousness. And I'm going to tell you, the plan of God for the, for the believer, the plan of God has three phases. I want you to learn that. If there, there's probably more, but I, if you just learn three, I'd be happy. There are three phases that you're engaged in, three phases in the plan of God. There's a salvation phase a Christian way of life phase, an eternal phase. You've got to understand these three. This is simple stuff here. And you need to get it down because, listen, this is a wonderful, other people don't know it. And they, as I was talking, I was talking this week, I was talking to a, a, a person and, and they were confused about it. I said, well, just get a napkin, come over, get a napkin, come over here, get a napkin and write one, two, and three down. I'm going to show you how simple the plan of God is. And she went, uh, okay, well, that would be, if you, I can just see how simple it is because I just keep hearing it, it seems so complicated. I said, well, let's just, and I, I put it on a napkin, phase one, two, and three. Here's, the, here's salvation, here's the Christian life, and here's eternity. And Let's get it simple and let's work to complicated. Let's not start with complicated to get it simple. Do you understand? So let's let's study let's study look at it simply. So I put I want you to understand how simple this stuff is and engage in it. For example, phase one in the plan of God is for salvation. It's imputed righteousness. When you're dealing with righteousness, it's imputed. In other words, it's given to you as a gift from God. When you believe the gospel, it is given to you as a gift from God. It's imputed righteousness of salvation. And I gave you a bunch of verses. What are you supposed to do? I wrote them on your paper. You're supposed to read them. Not now, because I'm limited with time. Uh, but I expect you to read them. Titus, and I usually put a primary one out first. Now, they're all primary, but I put one that I really like. If I had time, I would teach it is Titus 3.5. You can read Titus 3.5 through 7 would be wonderful. Imputed righteousness. Romans the third chapter 22 through 25. Fourth chapter first verse 8. And the fifth chapter 17 through 21. You want to pay attention to Romans the fifth chapter. You should read that, read that, read that, and read it again. And then you can also put down 10.10. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul wrote, and this is one of my favorites, and so I put it down. I wrote it because I love it. He made him, Christ, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's In him is positional truth. When anytime you see in him, that's positional truth. The moment you, the moment you believe the gospel of Christ, the Holy Spirit is going to baptize you into Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and Galatians 3, 27. And that's how you get into Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. He's a new creation. So th this is really important. In this passage, there's, this passage is so powerful. Him who, may, who knew no sin never experienced personal sin of any sort, at no Adam sin, no personal sin, became sin on our behalf, took care of both those issues, both the salvation and the personal. That's 1 John 1, 9, the personal. So that, divine purpose, so that he put, he put his son through all of that so that we, he put his son through all of that so we might become how do we become the right? When you believe it. When you believe it, you receive it. It's a gift. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him, that's positional truth. That's why it's imputed. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, he says, by his, by his doing, not by yours, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. That's positional truth because of the word in 
who became to us, Jesus Christ became to us four things. Jesus Christ became to us positionally four things. Watch these four things. The wisdom of God, the righteousness of God, the sanctification of God, and the redemption of God. All that's part of the package. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, man, that'll preach. Those four things. By his doing, not by your doing, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, positional truth, who became, Christ became to us the wisdom of God. In phase two of the, uh, is the Christian life, we call it experiential. You're now experiencing, you're now ex ex exercising the righteousness of God in your own life. It's the exercise. You not imputed, now it's being experienced. The righteousness of God is being, that's where you get to the fruit. Righteousness produ producing in you. In phase two is the Christian way of life in the plan of God. You should read passages like Romans 6, 12 through 13, verses 18 and 19. You should read Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. That's a special passage. You should circle that, in my opinion. You ought to read 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25, the third, third chapter of 1 Peter 14 through 18, and Ephesians 6, 13 to 14. You ought to circle that and read that. That's the angelic conflict. In Hebrews 5, 12 and 13, he tells us about experiential righteousness. He said, for the baby believer, the milk of the word introduces him to experiential righteousness because he's been beginning to grow spiritually out of the milk of the word of God. Those things that teach salvation to you and give you the confidence that you're saved today, tomorrow, and forever. And that moves you towards what's called solid food or meat, which is advanced doctrines of the Christian life. And it's all about experiential righteousness. You're going to experience right, the righteousness of God as a baby believer and as an immature believer and as a mature believer. And you're going to look back at the baby believer and you're going to go like, oh, wow, I remember I was there. Let me help you. And then when you get to we get into spiritual maturity, you can look to the other two groups and you can help both of them because you realize there's struggles in this idea of righteousness, experiential righteousness. And when you get to the angelic conflict, listen, you know, you put on the full armor of God. You know, one of them is righteousness. The breastplate. And who, who does that, who is that, who is that for? It's for you, but who, who are you fighting? Therefore, who do you think looks at that all the time? You don't. I mean, how you, right? Unless you hold the mirror out and go like, that's who I am. Let me tell you, the devil hates that. Every bit of that armor you have on, he hates because it beats him. It destroys him. You should pay attention to that armor. One of that armor that's a threat to Satan is your righteousness that you are wearing every day. Put on the full armor of God every day. How about that? Now, you can't put on what you don't know. See, this is putting it on. This is not being saved. This is being active, right? Put on the full armor of God. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's daily. That's experiential righteousness. It is the greatest threat to the devil in the whole world. And then when you pick up that sword, which is the, 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 the sword of the spirit of the word of God, Man, he's a cooked goose. He can't fight that. He can't fight a he can't fight a Christian like that. Every bit of that armor is a threat to him. 
And when you pick up that sword, he goes like, oh, a catfish. Or whatever he says. I don't know if he's into catfish or not, like I am. Probably not. And so I gave you a lot of passages for you to look at. It would be a good read for you. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 11, is talking about this experiential righteousness. Afterwards, he said, yet, he says, all discipline, divine discipline of a believer, for the moment seems not to be joyful, <laughs> but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it. Afterwards, you ought to circle that. <laughs> Afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? A peaceful fruit of righteousness. How wonderful is that? Uh, I would I would highly recommend since I have studied Philippians 1 9, 9 through 11 to you I would highly recommend the, the passage 2 Timothy 2 21 22 you should read it and you should read 1 Corinthians 6 18 through 20 in context phase 3 is the believer in eternity phase 3 in the plan of God is eternal is eternal righteousness watch this 2 Peter Third chapter, verses 11 through 13, a wonderful read. It says, in the new heaven and the new earth, that's where you're headed, all right? If you're a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is where you're headed, out there in the future. All right? You know what dwells there in context for us today? Absolute righteousness. In the new heaven and new earth dwells absolute righteousness. You don't get there without it. You know what absolute righteousness is? It's absolute identity of the person of God. Is he absolute righteous? When you, when you have that moment in your life, when you touch that absolute righteousness in your life, in time, you identify with the, with the person of God. In eternity, everybody will. I love that. See, that, and that's going to be a wonderful grace principle, isn't it? Because we're not all going to get there and get rewards and get all this stuff, but we're going to get all have absolute righteousness. We won't get rewarded for it in time. See, listen, every time you manifest experiential righteousness, you get awarded at the very bottom of your paper, at the very bottom of your paper, I am already, Paul wrote, listen to what Paul wrote, then we're going to leave. I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. In other words, he's, he's going to tell you the race he's, he's, he's run and the, the fight he's fought. He said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course. This is, I am being poured out as a drink offering. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. That's the first half of that. I've been poured out and my time has come. He has a premonition of his death. In the future, he said, I don't think I'm going to get out of this one. I believe I'm going to die in this this time they're going to put me in, they're going to, they're going to do me in. I just feel it, I feel it in my bones, or however he did it. In the future, however, isn't that good? They're going, to, they're going to kill this man, right? They're going to behead Paul. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day and not only me, but also all who have loved his appearing. Now, I put you down four crowns that can, be, get, that can be won in experiential righteousness. Uh, life, glory, exaltation, and righteousness. Uh, I want you to write these three passages down that will help you with this if you are interested in them. You should be. Uh, write these down. If you'll write down uh, Romans 14.10, 1 Corinthians 3.10-15, through 15, 
and 2 Corinthians 5.10, these will be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14.10, 1 Corinthians 3.10-15, 2 Corinthians 5.10, plus, plus the other verses I have given you on the four crowns. Uh, and I, I especially wanted you to be aware of the crown of righteousness. All right? So there you go. Righteousness. More than you ever expected to learn in one meeting. Okay? We give you more than you can eat, so we give you a doggy bag. We give you doggy bags. We, we, we expect you to go home and eat on them during the week. We know we overfeed because we have, to, we have to be able to teach people who are mature and immature and babies, so we try to do it all, which is not an easy balance. So, Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us the Word of God. We have looked at righteousness. We, we have introduced it. We have introduced the idea of it, Father. We've given them a lot of things to digest and look at and study. We hope they would do that. We hope they would gain information on it, learn to teach it. Uh, we teach for others to teach. Uh, we believe in that principle in our ministry. Uh, we look for a great week of ministry even today, Father, as we have started our day in the Word of God, may we continue that. May we have be in prayer over people. May we have our walk in experiential righteousness. May the fruit of righteousness be part of the tree of our life. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.